These are the results of an annual Gallup poll. For about the past decade or so, more than half of all Americans think that China's military and economic power are critical threats to the United States. The US's leaders and many of its people see China as their biggest enemy. And China's government and people view the US in much the same way. Regular working class people of both countries, who either visit or immigrate from one to the other, get along just fine though. So this hatred isn't coming from below, it's coming from the top. But why? To understand why the US ruling class feels so threatened by China's, all you have to do is look at history. Because what's happening between the US and China has happened before. It happened between the US and its European allies during the 60s and 70s, and then again between the US and Japan in the 1980s. It's happened on many smaller scales with many smaller countries all the way up into the 2010s. But China, as we'll see, is different. Things can't play out the same way as they did all those other times before. The US-Japanese War was one of the most brutal wars in all of human history. 50 square miles of Tokyo were burned. Tokyo was a wooden city, and when we dropped these firebombs, and it just burned it. LeMay was burning up Japan, and he went on from, from Tokyo to firebomb other cities. 58% of Yokohama, Yokohama is roughly the size of Cleveland, 58% of Cleveland destroyed. Tokyo is roughly the size of New York, 51% of New York destroyed. 99% of the equivalent of Chattanooga, which was Toyama. 40% of the equivalent of Los Angeles, which was Nagoya. This was all done before the dropping of the nuclear bomb, which, by the way, was dropped by LeMay's command. Proportionality should be a guideline in war. Killing 50 to 90 percent of the people of 67 Japanese cities and then bombing them with two nuclear bombs is not proportional. Was there a rule then that said you shouldn't bomb, uh, shouldn't kill, shouldn't burn to death 100,000 civilians in a night? LeMay said if we'd lost the war, we'd all have been prosecuted as war criminals. And I think he's right. He and I'd say I were behaving as war criminals. The United States unleashed hellfire against Japan in World War II. Every major and minor city, save five, were reduced to nothing. As the US firebombing campaigns torched cities, delayed explosives ensured firefighting and medical crews wouldn't dare enter the burning areas. Propaganda posters meant to brighten the American spirits bragged that soon the US would run out of targets for its bombing raids. This style of warfare would later inspire U.S. actions in Korea and Vietnam, but those are stories for other people to tell. It was also paralleled, though not anywhere near as intensely, on the European theater. All this is to say that both Japan and all the countries of Western Europe were soundly defeated in World War II, and afterward the U.S. could do what it liked with its vanquished foes. Our campaigns in the Second World War are often called liberations, but make no mistake, War is war. There are only two ways for a war to end, a negotiated peace or when one side is destroyed. There was no negotiated settlement for the fascist countries of Europe or the Empire of Japan. Japanese in the big cities like Tokyo and Yokohama are faced with acute shortages of food and goods of every description. Crowds gather at department stores, eager to purchase the few meager supplies available, and Yank MPs had their hands full, coping with the distracted people. Transportation facilities are jammed with people buying tickets for country areas where they can purchase food. The Japs have their housing problems, too. Many Japanese are almost destitute and construct rude shelters from the war rubble. Even the standard diet, rice, is strictly rationed. All of these countries conceded to effectively unconditional surrenders. This was when they all became U.S. vassal states. Occupation began almost immediately, an occupation which never ended, but we'll get back to that. But hold on, occupation, vassal, am I being serious? 
Hazel sure ain't a term really used in the US, for obvious reasons, but I hope it will become clear as we continue our discussion why I use it for both Japan and the US allies in Europe. You think the bull went number two? Fair enough. No judgment. I, like everyone else, am creating a narrative here. I'm at least nice enough to tell you that I'm doing it and not lie to you. All I ask of you for this video is to imagine the other side of the Iron Curtain. Imagine how you would think of Japan or Western Europe if any of the things we're going to talk about the US doing in this video were instead done by the USSR. Would you consider them to be truly independent, or would the term vassal seem more appropriate? Americans have been taught that empires and imperialism are something that other countries do. When I was in the sixth grade, my teacher said to us, the United States is the only advanced country that does not have colonies. And we'd look on this, big, we'd have this big map and there'd be these of the United States and there'd be these box inserts all around the sides. They'd be Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines. So we'd say to her, Miss Myers, what, what are these? Aren't those our colonies? She said, she said, the United States does not have colonies. It has territories or possessions. See, that's the magic of words. You wish away or you define away all sorts of brutal histories and realities by just using a different word. The US set up a parliamentary democracy in both Japan and its European vassals. Now, it might seem hard to control a country with democratic elections. Am I really suggesting that a parliamentary democracy is the same as installing a regime? Well, for sure, the US would later find installing brutal dictatorial regimes to be much easier, but there's a few things to consider. First, the US is not above using many types of manipulation to get its way in democratic countries. It has a long track record of covert influence and outright coups and physical violence administered by the CIA, the NED, and USAID. The moves made against the Italian Communist Party are perhaps most historically relevant to our discussion, even if we can't go into them right now. They happened in a country whose government was set up by the Americans after World War II during occupation. The CIA, with the help of some tamed labor unions like the AFL-CIO, covertly influenced and sabotaged the Italian public and Communist Party to get the result of the elections that the US wanted. Many former CIA operatives are notorious for openly talking about foreign election influence or regime overthrow. With all due respect, uh, one doesn't have to be brilliant to attempt a coup. Uh, I disagree with that. As somebody who has helped plan coup d'etat, yeah. not here, but you know, other places, uh, it takes a lot of work. Have we ever tried to meddle in other countries' elections? Oh, probably, but uh, it was for the good of the system in order to avoid the communists from taking yeah. over. For example, in Europe, uh, uh, in 47, 48, 49, uh, the Greeks and the Italians, we We don't do that CIA. now, though? We don't mess around other people's well, elections, yeah? Mm, nom, 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 nom. <laughs> Ah. Only for a very good Can cause. Can you do that? Do a Vine video on a former CIA director. Only really. for a very good cause in okay. the interests of democracy. All right, thanks for being here. Even at the polls, the US is not above simply falsifying the results to ensure that it maintains control over these foreign countries. We'll talk about what US control looked like over Japan's democracy later on. Spoilers, it involves cults and the Yakuza. Not to mention, when was the last time all of the elected officials in a representative democracy voted to abolish capitalism or disempower the business class, to redistribute all the wealth of billionaires or something like that? Just like how the state ownership of factories wasn't up for debate in the East, the private ownership of factories wasn't up for debate in the West. Though representative democracy seems like the go-to, maybe even the only true way to have a free and democratic society to us Westerners, it has tons of stuff baked into it about what democracy and freedom even mean. Basic things like whether to have direct democracy instead of representative elections, what property rights were going to be like, whether there would be political parties, whether government offices would be filled by lottery instead of elections, or any of the other fundamental changes to government that you could imagine, were all completely out of the question in post-war Europe and Japan. And unless you assume that the peoples of these countries were of the most unimaginative sort and couldn't possibly conceive of any other form of social arrangement, it's likely that each side set up whatever type of government they thought would be best to keep their own interests in power. The governments of conquered countries on both sides of the Iron Curtain looked incredibly similar to those of their occupiers.
Japan in particular was a special project for the United States. It wanted a base against communism in Asia, and Japan was, at the time, the only place it could really do this. Taiwan was not independent at this point, remember, and Korea was much more complicated. The US also wasn't looking to do this for human rights reasons, by the way. A reminder that its allies were the European empires, the colonial empires, who still had all their colonies and were given them back after the war. With new governments in place, the US still needed to secure its new position in both Europe and Japan. To do this, it soon created the main tool of its dominance in the post-war world. During the war, the US didn't gain any of the Japanese or European Empire's territory for itself, but what it did gain was the vast majority of their gold. At the end of World War II, the US controlled three quarters of all monetary gold in the world. The US didn't annex any territory because it didn't need to. This gold would form the basis of the US empire. With it, it could control these countries without ever needing to annex them, though it still made sure to maintain the sizable military presence it had established during the war. It created this control via the Bretton Woods Agreement. Bretton Woods was an international system to control the exchange rates of all the major global currencies. The enforcing agency was the International Monetary Fund. Strange how they keep popping up. Bretton Woods was the main tool of US domination, aside of course from the US military. Here's how it worked. It stipulated that every country occupied by the United States would have its exchange rate fixed in place relative to the US dollar. This included all the major European empires, by extension their colonies, and of course, Japan. All these formerly independent currencies would have their exchange rate fixed in place relative to the US dollar. Having a fixed exchange rate, and I'm serious, is often called pegging. The occupied country's currencies were pegged to the US dollar. None of their currencies would be backed by gold any longer, but instead they'd be backed by US dollars. The US dollar would be the only one backed by gold and at a fixed exchange rate of $35 per ounce. The US inserted itself between all of these countries and their gold reserves. Gold it had only gained in the first place by selling these countries vital goods during the war, though we often phrase this as something that we did out of the kindness of our hearts. Okay, big whoop, how exactly is that US domination? Great question. The answer is trade. The exchange rate between currencies controls many things. Having a pegged exchange rate heavily restricts monetary and fiscal policy, because that exchange rate has to be maintained by government action. It also controls how expensive it is for one country to buy things from another. If a country wants to export things, or if another country wants to force it to export things, it can make its currency incredibly cheap to buy. Countries that want to sell things want their currency to be very cheap. This is called a weak currency. Countries that want to buy things from other countries want very valuable or strong currencies. One unit of their currency will buy two or three or even a hundred units of another. But with a weak currency, someone could buy two or three or even a hundred times more from you. By forcing a fixed exchange rate, you're forcing which end of the economic arrangement a country is on. Bretton Woods was how the United States ruling class controlled its allies' economies throughout the next decades. But what about the Marshall Plan? We invested tons into Europe to help all those countries rebuild. Why would we do such a great thing if we actually wanted to control them? Here's a perfect example of what I mentioned from earlier. The USSR also poured massive amounts of money into Europe to rebuild it. But if anyone learns about this, they say it was because Moscow was trying to get control and make their economies entirely dependent on Russia. But when the US does it, it was out of the kindness of our hearts and to save the world from communism. Please ignore that all these billions were only given to friendly regimes. If all those people were truly suffering under communism and our aid would raise them up, why did they get nothing? The Marshall Plan was the US investing in its new factories, the European empires. For Bretton Woods to truly work, these countries needed to rebuild and rebuild in the exact way the US wanted. Does anyone really think out there that if these countries weren't in line with US interests, they would have gotten all of this money? The US pegged the currencies of its new vassals incredibly cheaply so that it could easily buy whatever it wanted from them. Its plan was to deindustrialize itself and rely on its new vassals to make everything it needed. They would all have to export to keep their economies alive, and the Americans would be the only ones with a strong enough currency to buy it. As their biggest customer, their economies were whatever America wanted to purchase. 
the U.S. had immense control over what the economies of all of Western Europe looked like after World War II. Remember that these cities had been bombed twice, first by the Nazis and then by the Americans in their reconquest. Bretton Woods ensured Europe and Japan would rebuild exactly how the U.S. wanted. The country where this was most obvious is Japan. Japan was given an incredibly cushy exchange rate at 360 yen to 1 US dollar. Japan would have no problems developing an export economy. Japan's government also took an incredibly heavy hand to ensure that this was the case. About as far opposite of laissez-faire as you can get regarding government intervention in the economy without going full Soviet-style central planning. These two things, the favorable exchange rate and the government planning, saw Japan's economy explode in size. It could sell the same quality products that US companies would produce, but at a third the price. No wonder this circuit fails. It says made in Japan. What do you mean, Doc? All the best stuff is made in Japan. Unbelievable. And the Japanese government forced the revenues to be reinvested into capital improvements or research and development, adding back into the feedback loop. This competition with Japanese imports led to incredible and long-lasting anti-Japanese sentiment in the US from the workers who were being undersold by Japanese firms. Workers and people, unaware of just how manufactured this whole arrangement was, pointed the finger at Japan. Remember, it was the same people raking in all of this money that owned their news media. The US ruling class orchestrating the teardown of US industry were happy to let some foreign country take the blame. Who cared if they were the ones building Japan up? Image was all that mattered. Throughout the 50s and 60s, Europe and Japan were firmly within control via Bretton Woods. Japan especially was a huge success. The regime the US had put in place was loyal and its economy was growing. Everything was working exactly as planned. So what's the catch? Bretton Woods was working great for America's ruling class. How does it all fall apart? Well, we need to look at the other parts of America's empire. But first, a word about the Patreon. Currently, I do not run ads on my channel for a multitude of reasons, chief among them being that I don't want to profit from what I see as a visceral invasion of privacy. I also release all of my videos under Creative Commons because I disagree strongly with how copyright works. So if I were to be paid to make videos, the only way would be something like Patreon. Becoming a patron gets your name in the credits, patron-exclusive updates, and early access to videos. I will always keep the amount of money I make public and post how much time I spent doing all the various things it takes to make each of these videos. You also only get charged when I release a full video. I don't charge for shorts. Consider that if you've got two bucks to spare each month. All the people nice enough to give me money are scrolling across the screen right now. And a special thanks to Temno Spondle. Now back to the video. Bretton Woods was effective, but it wasn't perfect. Many of the Western European countries were often very unhappy to be vassals of the United States, mostly those who were empires themselves and had vassals of their own. They knew what the US was doing, and their ruling classes would speak publicly about it, in a way not many do anymore. They would call out our scheme in the press. France was one such country. It hated having a currency backed by US dollars instead of gold, and hated even more having such a low-value currency. Charles de Gaulle, a president of France, was constantly in the news, calling out the United States. He would publicly gripe about what he called the US's exorbitant privilege. Fantastic term. The entire global economy is based on dollars, he would complain. For France to get 100 US dollars, we must actually produce 100 dollars worth of things and sell them to the Americans. But if America wishes to have $100, it spends a few cents at the printers. Rarely do foreign leaders, especially US allies, call our shit out like this. Saying the US's place in the world is due to force rather than our nation's inherent justice is sacrilege. <laughs> 
Domestically, you might hear our ruling class insist that the reason the rest of the world uses the US dollar is due to our sound economic principles and rational choice of government, which is clearly the most sublime of any in the world. Others look towards us and our ideals and trust deeply our perfect institutions above all else. In reality, the US dollar being the global currency is because of what the US government does to countries who try to do anything else. And don't worry, we're soon going to see what that looks like. Now, empires never stand naked in their rapacity. They never stand naked in their violent injustice. They don't turn to their people who have to pay the price of empire and taxation and the blood of our brothers and sisters and sons and daughters and fathers and mothers. They don't have to pay for that, but they got to tell these people something. And so they give their people a host of rationales. On top of restless vassals, by the 1970s, the US was facing its own problems. The ongoing Vietnam War was incredibly costly, the trade balance had gone negative, and social spending was incredibly high. Social spending was so high that the US business class openly said that they feared the US was becoming a social democracy. In 1978, which was the beginning of the third year of Jimmy Carter's administration, a US Chamber of Commerce guy commented and said, we have got to roll this back. We got to stop it. We are becoming a social democracy. So these guys understood the term social democracy. There's only about four or 500 people in America who understand the term. Both conservative and liberal think tanks talked about rolling back there was too much democracy in society. Too many Americans disagreed with the free enterprise system and large covert operations needed to be undertook domestically to restore the business class to its place of prominence. I'm not lying. <laughs> See, they aren't stupid. They know what a social democracy is and how it works. They saw one was coming and did everything in their power to stop it. You can't just convince the ruling class with great arguments and new information about the wonders of welfare programs to just give up their power. They know all about that. They don't care. They play dumb, but they ain't dumb. And when you think, when you think those who rule you, when you think those who rule the wealth and control the markets and the labor and the resources of society and set the wages and define the labor market and control the media culture. When you think they're stupid, then you're being stupid. The owners of the country have to, they bought their elect, got their election. They said we're going to get this election. We put you people in that court for a reason. All right, Now's back the time to, to pay earth us. for you and now. Yeah, forget all that stupid. <laughs> <will you? laughs> you, they're out in the open. They're, open, no. they're openly driving the bus, there. and we're all in the back. There is no, well, was, there that... is no national conspiracy to buy elections and control America. Now that's... talk about oh, back to oh, earth. Back to you conspiracy, need, but you because... don't need a formal conspiracy. Right. When interests converge, these people went to the same universities oh, and please. fraternities. They're on it's the same boards simple. of directors. They're in the same country clubs. They have like interests. They yes. don't need to call a meeting. They know what's good for them. It's a and they're getting it. And there, there used to be this... seven oil companies there are now three it will soon be two the things that matter in this country have been reduced in choice there are two political parties there are a handful of insurance companies there are about six or seven in information things. but if you want a bagel there are 23 flavors because you have the illusion you have the illusion of choice right you don't get the real important choice there's no freedom of choice every bit of progress that's been made for working people and the oppressed has been taken by force it was never convincingly debated into their hands or given out as a reward for good behavior. Because of the federal spending for both the war and social programs, the amount of US dollars in circulation began to grow, but the amount of gold in its reserves did not. It became clear that the official exchange rate between US dollars and gold, $35 per ounce, was not matching reality. When the actions of other countries' governments put them out of line with the Bretton Woods Agreement, they were forced to correct by the IMF. So would that happen to the US? <laughs> okay, here's the problem. The US was backing about $14 billion held by foreign central banks with gold. Wait, central banks? Okay, so when foreign companies sold stuff to America, they would receive US dollars. Now, you can't buy anything in, say, Germany with US dollars, so these companies would go to their central banks and exchange them for their local currency. So central banks would end up with all these US dollars. But what can central banks use them for? Well, nothing. Bretton Woods stipulated that all other currencies would just be backed up by US dollars. 
So a central bank growing U.S. dollar reserves just meant that more of its own currency was being backed up. And since the U.S. dollar was backed up by gold itself, by translation, so were their own money supplies. The U.S. put a currency that it had full control over as the basis of the entire global economy. And these countries, they knew they could exchange their U.S. dollars for gold at any time they wanted. So what's the issue? Right? So about 14 billion U.S. dollars was held by foreign central banks. At the pegged $35 per ounce, that's 400 million ounces of gold that the U.S. should have. But the U.S. only had 377 million ounces of gold, about $13.2 billion in its vaults. Of that, about $10 billion, 286 million ounces, was reserved for U.S. domestic dollars. And only 3.2 billion, 91 million ounces, was backing up the 14 billion dollars abroad. Now, this actually isn't the issue. In fact, it was nothing new. There were way more than 10 billion dollars in the domestic economy at this time. And just like how the bank doesn't have enough cash in its vault to pay out all the accounts at once, the US never had enough gold in its vault to pay out all of its accounts at once. As long as all of these foreign countries didn't try to redeem all their gold at once, the system would be fine. But now the US was basically just printing money to finance itself and its war. The ratio between how much gold the US would need to back up all of its money and the actual gold that it had began to get worrying. Not to mention that such spending was in violation of Bretton Woods, but the independent and neutral IMF never stepped in. During this time, many European countries began looking for a way out of Bretton Woods. Right around the time Eastern Europe was seeing some movements trying to break out of the USSR-led hegemony, Western Europe was trying to break out of US hegemony. See, multiple countries in Bretton Woods had to take moves to revalue their currencies, multiple times to adhere to the agreement. France is the most noteworthy example of this. France, for many reasons, did not want a low-value currency, but that was just too bad. The US wanted to ensure that no one else could play its game, and that relied on keeping its vassal currencies where it wanted them. The French government, like its other European and Japanese counterparts, would always implement US demands for currency, though it was often phrased as IMF demands to keep the country in line with the Bretton Woods Agreement. Monetary policy, regardless of who won the elections in France, was not decided by France. But sure, unlike those evil Soviets who put up puppet governments, the ones the US put up were democratic and based on self-determination. Please ignore the fact that regardless of which party wins the elections, they can only make monetary and fiscal moves that keep the United States happy. Those US troops stationed there who never left after defeating the Nazis must just be there to protect the democracy from the Soviet invaders. The Russians had troops in the East for horrible occupation and warmongering reasons. In reality, much of the reason the modern European Union exists can be traced back to this exact period of hatred that the European countries felt being occupied vassal states to the US. Here's a quote by former French President Charles de Gaulle on the Treaty of Rome, the thing which would eventually lead to the modern European Union. The purpose of Europe, he said, is to avoid domination by the Americans or Russians. Europe is the means by which France can once again become what she has not been since Waterloo, first in the world. And it wasn't just economically that these countries were dominated by the United States, their international policies were forced to be subordinate to US interests. It was a little earlier than this time that the UK and France colluded with Israel behind the United States' back to invade Egypt and rebuild their influence. It is now known as the Suez Crisis, and the US was infuriated. The Suez Canal, storm center of controversy for weeks, now becomes a cause of war in a lightning sequence of diplomatic and military moves. Since its seizure and nationalization by President Nasser of Egypt, crack French units are embarked at Marseille, bound for a joint staging area with Great Britain on Cyprus. Less than an hour's flight from Egyptian ports, where they are prepared for seizure of the canal by force, even as Israel, in a lightning attack, thrusts deep into Egypt to the vicinity of the canal. France and Britain issue a 12-hour ultimatum that all fighting must cease. Within hours of its exploration, Britain's warplanes are winging their way to Egypt, and its bombers attack five key cities, including Cairo. At his weekly press conference, President Eisenhower decries the use of force and hopes for a peaceful settlement on Suez. In Tel Aviv, 100,000 Israelis march in protest against the United Nations order to evacuate the Gaza Strip and positions on the Gulf of Agaba. Not over the plight of those poor imperial subjects, the U.S. still had Jim Crow and Hawaii at this time, 
but because its vassals dared act without its permission. The US publicly threatened to do serious damage to the British financial system if it and France didn't stop. It would sell its massive stockpile of pound sterling bonds, flooding the market and destroying the UK's interest rates. Exchange rates were already directly under US control via Bretton Woods, but so were interest rates. Imagine if a foreign country controlled US interest rates. Europe knew what the US was doing. Or how about NATO? Here's a quote from the first general secretary of NATO from the time, not the Nazi one. <laughs> The purpose of NATO is to keep the Soviet Union out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. Europe was occupied. It was by design. Devaluation after devaluation, each one was wildly unpopular with the European public. And why shouldn't they be? They never voted for any of them. The will of the people meant nothing to the US government who actually controlled their country's monetary and fiscal policies. All this time that the US was forcing other countries to adhere to the Bretton Woods Agreement for its own benefit, restricting what economic policies they could have, restricting their government spending and economic activity to within a narrow range of what pleased it, all of this time the US was violating Bretton Woods, printing money left and right to finance its spending, putting the exchange rate at risk, and relying on its vassals to pick up the slack. If the dollar became too weak from all this money printing to finance an imperialist war on the other side of the world, it was never a question of what the US should do to revalue its own currency, but what the other vassals should do to devalue their own. Never once considering what it was forcing the other countries to do. Soon, some US vassals began taking less than desirable moves for the US ruling class. Various politicians across Europe saw the writing on the wall and said as much publicly. Karl Blessing, president of the Bundesbank, said, We should have aggressively have converted the dollars into gold until the Americans were driven to despair. But she didn't! This was one of the core faults of Bretton Woods. Even though these countries had almost no control over their economic policies or exchange rate, they could have started exchanging US dollars for gold and the whole system would begin to unravel. With this, the whole scheme began to crumble. In 1966, de Gaulle protested and refused to devalue the French franc and started amassing gold. France was doing sacrilege, actually exchanging the US dollars that it held for the gold that they were backed by. The international community and US press shat on him for this, and many investors wondered why the French franc was no longer being backed up by as much US reserve currency. De Gaulle was soon replaced by George Pompidou, who devalued the franc and was praised by the US press and ruling class. But then, he did the unthinkable. In 1971, President Pompidou made history. I'm standing here tonight, I'm afraid that I don't hear a thing. Just. Silence. New York City, home of the most important branch of the Federal Reserve, deep below the ground resting on Manhattan bedrock, to this day is a quarter of all the gold ever taken from the earth. A hundred vaults contain the gold of various governments and international entities, each labeled with only a simple number to ensure that the workers who spend their days moving bars from one vault to the other to balance accounts have no idea whose gold is whose. On one fateful August day in 1971, President Pompidou sent a single battleship across the Atlantic and docked it off the coast of New York City. Pompidou's battleship withdrew all of the gold France was owed, and the world was changed forever. West Germany left the Bretton Woods system after refusing to devalue the Deutschmark. It gained almost 8% of value against the dollar. The UK, America's strongest and most obedient vassal in Europe, told the US to move $3 billion of gold from Fort Knox to New York City, a heavy indication that it was going to withdraw all of its gold as well. 
Sunday, August 15th, mere days after France withdrew all of its gold on a literal warship, after an emergency meeting with the Federal Reserve, President Richard Nixon puts a stop to everything. We must protect the position of the American dollar as a pillar of monetary stability around the world. In the past seven years, there's been an average of one international monetary crisis every year. Now, who gains from these crises? The gainers are the international money speculators. In recent weeks, the speculators have been waging an all-out war on the American dollar. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. Nixon ended the convertibility of U.S. dollars to gold. He shut down the gold trading window at the Federal Reserve. He announced a 10% tariff across the board on all imports, and via executive order, froze all prices and wages across the country for 90 days to stop inflation. The time has come for decisive action, action that will break the vicious circle of spiraling prices and costs. I am today ordering a freeze on all prices and wages throughout the United States for a period of 90 days. So don't let anyone tell you that the president can't do shit to stop inflation. Nixon, in one single speech, abolished the gold standard and the entire international money system around it. The so-supposedly impartial IMF did nothing to punish the U.S. for this violation. Sounds like a win for the vassals, though, right? Well, not so much. First, anyone holding U.S. dollars was now literally left holding the bag. They now had nothing they could exchange them for. America also immediately forbid any foreign country from using U.S. dollars that were obtained through trade to invest in American companies. The only asset that it let the foreign central banks buy was U.S. Treasury bills. The only thing anyone could buy with U.S. dollars was the U.S.'s government debt. In one fell swoop, the U.S., had swept the rug out from under its vassals and solved its two major problems by only allowing foreign holders of U.S. dollars to buy U.S. government debt. The huge government deficit that it was accruing was now being fully funded by other countries, and these countries were now stuck, unable to redeem their U.S. dollars for anything else. Its hold on the global economy was now stronger than it had ever been, and it didn't even have to fire a single bullet to do it. In 1971, John Connolly, Richard Nixon's Treasury Secretary, famously told a delegation of Europeans worried about exchange rate fluctuations that the American dollar, quote, is our currency, but your problem. When a single country acts out against its total domination by the U.S. business class, it's obvious what happens. Embargoes, sanctions, invasions, sabotage, civil wars— any country which isn't unlucky enough to have tons of U.S. troops stationed in it will soon have a ton of U.S. troops stationed in it. But when they all get together, something like this happens. In response to the U.S., every other country in Bretton Woods basically had to float its currency as well. This meant that instead of there being a fixed exchange rate, the exchange rate between currencies was determined by however much there was available of their currency on the marketplace. The market for foreign exchange is called the Forex market, by the way, and it's huge. To this day, Nixon claimed he wanted to stop speculators. Bullshit. Europe tried to break the international system of dollars and weaken U.S. control over their economies. The U.S. responded by completely destroying the international money system and creating a new one with itself back on top. You have meddled with the primal forces of nature, Mr. Beale, and I won't have the U.S. now had a bigger tool up its sleeve than gold ever could have been. Its debt. With this, the U.S. empire had finally rested on a foundation much more stable than gold. Dollar recycling. And here's how that works. But actually, we'll have to get back to it next time. For this channel's first ever two-parter, next time we're going to talk about what the current international monetary system looks like, how the U.S. continues to keep it under its control, what the end of Bretton Woods meant for Japan, and what all of this means for why the U.S. and China hate each other. Because during all of this, and all the things to come, China has been watching.
You have meddled with the primal forces of nature, Mr. Beale, and I won't have it! You are an old man who thinks in terms of nations and peoples. There are no nations. There are no peoples. There is only one holistic system of systems. One vast and main, interwoven, interacting, multivariate, multinational dominion of dollars. Petrodollars, electrodollars, multidollars, Reichmarks, rims, rubles, pounds, and shekels. It is the international system of currency which determines the totality of life on this planet. That is the natural order of things today. And you have meddled with the primal forces of nature. And you will atone. Am I getting through to you, Mr. Beale?